Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The service you are about to hear was previously recorded, but we'd invite you to stop by and check out one of our services in action at 10 a.m. each Sunday here at Countryside in Sandusky, Michigan, or check it out on our Facebook or YouTube page. God bless and have a wonderful day. All right. Well, if you would, please, at this time, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 139 and buckle up. All right. Today's going to be a little different. I'm sorry, Superintendent Jeff. It's going to be a little different than most Sundays around here because we usually focus on one main passage of Scripture. And, you know, we touch on several truths flowing out of that one main passage. But today we're going to we're going to kind of flip things around. All right. We're going to touch on several passages of Scripture, all kind of touching on one common truth. And in case you you might have missed the memo, today is recognized by many as the the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday or day. Uh, In fact, on January 22nd, 1984, way back then, President Ronald Reagan issued a presidential proclamation designating the third Sunday of January, or as close to that as possible, as National Sanctity of Human Life Day. So by this action, President Reagan was standing up for one group in particular of vulnerable people, and we're going to touch on that group today. But first, I want us to cover a few of the basics about this special day. First, let's just start at the beginning, all right? What does this term sanctity mean? That's not one of those words we use in our everyday language, right? The online dictionary defines sanctity as the state or quality of being holy, sacred, or saintly. So the sanctity of human life refers to the holiness or sacredness of human life, as in human life is to be treasured and cherished. Now, obviously, you know, just because Ronald Reagan said it doesn't make it so. You know, the world doesn't just work off of his words or proclamations. So we need to ask ourselves, as truth seekers, is there merit or support for this viewpoint of having a special day or, or this concept of the sanctity of human life in even greater documents. And I'm here to tell you that as free Methodists, we believe that there is. We believe one can see the following truth arising from a sin- sincere study of the Bible, and that is this. All human life is sacred to and cherished by God. Amen. Amen. As a, as a church denomination, let me just tell you, pull a couple lines out of our book of discipline. These are some of the statements that you'll find there. It says, we commit ourselves to respect the worth of all persons as created in the image of God. And under the, the section entitled Dignity and Worth of Persons, it says, we are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the unborn, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, color, socioeconomic status, disability, or any other distinctions, and will respect them as persons made in the image of God and redeemed by Christ's death and resurrection. Folks, let me just say, we do not have to agree with everyone's decisions with their philosophies, or with their lifestyle choices. But we do need to respect them because all people, again, no matter how great or small, have an inherent worth because we are all created in the image of Almighty God, and therefore we are important to Him. So, let's look in Scripture at a few, of, few groups of people that are often overlooked, and marginalized, or mistreated in our world today so that we don't fall into that trap of neglecting or mistreating some of those precious people for whom Christ died and was resurrected. For those of you taking notes, I'm going to give you 10 different groups. So just like I said, buckle up. Here they come, okay? Number one, the unborn and their mothers. And since Sanctity of Life Day was originally centered around the unborn, let's start there, beginning with what King David said in Psalm 139, where he said, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Folks, we are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the unborn and their mothers. And as followers of Christ, we need to do our best to care for both mother and child before, during, and after pregnancy. And on a local level, we as a church, we support and we partner with Sparrow Pregnancy Center to help families and those facing unplanned pregnancies. And so I just want to tell you, and I'm going to kind of do this throughout this, this message this morning, give you some tips here on how you can get involved and get plugged in. If God is touching your heart to help the unborn and their mothers, I want to encourage you to connect with the folks at Sparrow. And, and we are posting some of their, you know, their mailings and documents on our bulletin board right outside the restrooms down the hallway. And there are often opportunities for people to get involved who are, uh, have this particular group on their hearts. So I just want to encourage you to check it out. Look for the S-P-E-R-O, Sparrow. Uh, look for that group down there on the bulletin board. The second group I want to call your attention to this morning are the elderly. Leviticus 19.32 says, Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. Can I get an amen from, the older, from us older folks? Us older folks, amen. Right. I, notice I include myself. Uh, uh, and you know what? There's often another passage quoted that applies to an even more specific group of folks who are older than we are. Exodus 20 verse 12 says this, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now I know we usually quote that one when we're speaking to the children who are still at home, you know, between zero and 18, right? Because we want to make sure they get this, that they honor mom and dad, right? But guess what? I don't see an age limit in there. Do you? No, and I just want to say this, that many here in our church and community, we are living on property or on homesteads that have been in the family for generations, aren't we? And some of us know what it is to have three or four generations living under the same roof. Well, guess what? That doesn't work if there is little or no respect for the elders among us, does it? You know what? In many countries in our world today, that is the norm. Younger families caring for their aging parents or grandparents in their own home. Check this out. According to usafacts.org, they say this, quote, In 2022, there were an estimated 4.8 million multi-generational households in the U.S., homes with three or more generations living under one roof. So guess what? It is not as uncommon, even here in the United States, as you might think. And I know that while that particular model isn't going to work in everyone's situation, we all should still be aiming to honor and respect all of our elders. We are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the elderly. I want to focus on another passage for a few moments. Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 36. It actually touches on several groups, and we'll take them one at a time here in just a moment. But these groups, again, are often those marginalized or neglected or mistreated. Jesus himself said, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. So first... In that group are the hungry and thirsty. Uh, the Food Research and Action Center, FRAC.org, has uh, a few interesting t statistics. It says, in the U.S. in 2022, one in eight households experienced food insecurity 
or lack of access to an affordable, nutritious diet. That's an estimated 44.2 million Americans living in those households, the hungry. It goes on to say one in 20 households experience very low food security, uh, a more severe form of food insecurity where households report regularly skipping meals or reducing intake because they could not afford more food. Children, over one in six households with children experienced food insecurity. Rural, households in rural areas experienced deeper struggles with hunger compared to those in metro areas. 2022, it says 14 0.7% of households in rural areas experienced food insecurity. And worldwide, nearly one in 10 people around the world go to bed hungry each night. Just want to say, if God prompts you to help the hungry and you aren't sure how, I'd like to suggest you begin by talking with our friends Dave and Kelly Tresnak, the directors of our food pantry. Dave and Kelly, can you wave a hand? They're back there about halfway back. Let's see Dave and Kelly if you are interested in helping. Um, they, we can always use more volunteers to help with our food pantry and distribution, and I'm sure they have some other ideas on ways that we can help those who are hungry and thirsty here even in our own community. We are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the hungry and thirsty. Another group Jesus mentioned, the strangers, the newcomers. Uh, from the statistics that I read online this week, most homeowners in the U.S. live in their homes now between 10 and 15 years. Okay, so that's plenty of time for you to get to know your neighbors if they're you know, living in the house next door, all right? However, most apartment dwellers, they only live in their apartment for about two years at a time. So, not quite so easy to get to know them, right, in the busyness of our schedules these days. Plus, I know we all battle the unknown when we're dealing with new people around us. You know, there are some, some pretty good reasons why, you know, folks in the past would teach their kids this little phrase, stranger danger, right? Um, and yet, Jesus commended those who invited the stranger in. You know, it would be nice if he had given us a little pamphlet, you know, on the how, the when, and the where to do that, uh, to invite them in. But since he didn't, let me, let me just give you a relatively place safe, safe place to start, okay? If during the course of one of our little meet and greets here on a Sunday morning, even this morning, you know, you encounter somebody that's new to you, uh, I would say the same gender, keep it a little, even a little safer, guess what? You could invite them to come and join you for one of our Sunday classes, Sunday groups that meets here, either before or after the service next Sunday. You know, again, you're meeting here, you're meeting in a Bible study, can't get much safer place than that, all right? Um, or if God gives you a great big green light, you could even invite them to go with you to lunch or coffee. Again, sometime in a public place. That's a good way to get to know somebody uh, and, again, to help invite them in to the warmth of our community. Folks, we are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including strangers and newcomers. Number five is the poor. Jesus said, I needed clothes and you clothed me. Jesus mentioned our treatment of the poor, specifically those needing clothes. Um, we've, as a church, we've been partnering with our friends down at Help Incorporated here in town for a number of years to provide affordable clothing for those who are in need and to help those who occasionally need a little extra hand in paying a utility bill or a rent type bill. And so let me just say this. If God might be prompting you this morning to help those who are struggling in our community in this way, I want to just in, invite you to speak with one of our friends. Right over here in the corner, about midway back, we've got Nancy and Jackie and Connie. Can you guys raise your hands? They all volunteer down there at Hope Incorporated, and uh, they would love to talk with you about how you can help get involved there. Amen. Um, we are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the poor and struggling. 
Then we have the sick. Jesus said, I was sick and you looked after me. Jesus commended those who looked after the sick. Do you notice he didn't just commend those who miraculously healed people? Do you notice that? He said, look after the sick. And I just want to let you know, in case you missed this on your way in, there's a music stand right outside those center doors. And on that music stand, there are little prayer sheets that have a number of prayer requests for people who are sick or struggling in our church. It would be a very easy place to start to pick up one of those and pray for those people. You could also make a call if you know them. Give them a quick call. Let them know you're thinking about them. You could pray with them right there on the phone. You could even ask if there's a way that you could help them, maybe by making a meal for them. Or you could ask if you could swing by sometime for a visit. I would recommend these days that you call uh, ahead before you stop by and visit some, try to visit somebody. Because um, guess what? Sometimes they're not at home, right? Sometimes if you're going to the hospital, guess what? They've, they've already been released. And so you get there, and it's like, oh, they're not here. <laughs> um, so call ahead. It just, it just makes sense, all right? Um, what we want to be committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the sick. The next one is imprisoned. Jesus said, Jesus said, I was in prison and you came to visit me. Guess what? God loves those who are in jail or in prison too. And I believe that many people who find themselves incarcerated start looking at that point for a better way to live their lives. They may not know it yet, but I think what they're really looking for is Jesus. And while I wouldn't necessarily recommend that any one of us, you know, who just gets a whim today walks down to the, you know, county jail or local jail and, and, and tries to reach out from basically square one, um, if God touches your heart, for those who are in that position, I can recommend that you connect with our friend Dave Salowitz, who is working locally with Reach the Forgotten. Again, incredible ministry already happening to those who are in the system. Again, we are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the imprisoned. Another two groups often mentioned in the Bible together are widows and orphans. Now, I, I know what you're thinking, Pastor Kyle. That was, that was then in the Bible, right? This is now. I mean, we have systems in place for the, wis, for the widows and orphans in our world today, right? I mean, that's what we pay the government for. But check out this powerful statement from the book of James. James said in chapter 1, that those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Wow, it almost sounds like we are supposed to be looking after orphans and widows, not delegating that responsibility to some government-run institution. Huh. wonder what that would look like in our world today. If the church stepped up in that way. You know, I remember reading not too long ago, and I think it was a Francis Chan book, uh, where he said that if one family in every Bible-believing church in the United States, just one family from each church, were to adopt one child out of the U.S. foster care system, guess what? We could rescue all of the orphans currently in our country today. Can you imagine just one family adopting one child in each church? Now, let me just be brutally honest with you for a moment, okay? I'm actually not aware of any kids in our church community, at least, that people would consider to be an orphan, at least not, not right yet. But I do know personally a number of widows and widowers who could use an extra hand now and then and a friendly visit from time to time. Quick 
personal story. One of our regulars, a widow, fell down her steps this past Monday. She hurt herself. She couldn't even open her own food. She had to call neighbors to help come and help her out. A friend took her to the hospital just yesterday. Her shoulder was broken in multiple places. She'd been trying to deal with that all week. I think it's time we get a little more organized on this front as a church to help our, our friends who are elderly, the widows, the widowers. We are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including widows and orphans. Let me give you another passage that wraps another group in along with widows and orphans, and that is the foreigner. Check out what this passage says in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Verse 28 says, At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. I know, folks, I've read this passage before, but I must have glossed over it because I missed something. At the, did you catch that? At the end of every three years, God's people were to bring in all the tithes for that year and store it in their towns. And why? So that these people, the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows might be provided for. Wow, that's, that's radical. I mean, even in a church our size, that would be an amazing bounty that we could provide for the needs of a lot of people in those groups. And again, people even not originally from this country. We are committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including the foreigners among us. And finally, we get to our enemies. Under a section entitled Love in Action from Romans chapter 12, we read these words. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I know the list of enemies for the average John or Jane Christian these days seems to be getting longer and longer. Every time we turn around, there's some other group that is up in arms talking against us, talking out about us, cutting us down, uh, just talking about taking us out, right? And what's, what's the world's typical response to confrontation like that? Stand up, right? Fight back. Take the bully out. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what he modeled in his life, is it? As that old song says, you know what? He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have overturned not just the tables in the temple, but the whole kit and caboodle system. He could have silenced the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He could have ousted Rome or any other enemy of Israel. He could have shrugged off that cross at any point in time. And walked away. But he didn't, did he? Instead, he overcame evil with good. And that's what we are exhorted to do as well. Jesus didn't make any pie in the sky promises that if we followed him, we would no longer have any enemies. 
On the contrary, he said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, what? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. That was his plan for dealing with bullies and our enemies. Folks, we need to understand that we need to be committed to the dignity and worth of all humans, including our enemies and foreigners and widows and orphans and the imprisoned and the sick and the poor and the stranger and the hungry and thirsty and the elderly and the unborn and their mothers. That's a lot. It's a lot of different people groups and a lot to process. And you know what? That's not even an exhaustive list. Where do we, where do we even start? Let me give you just a few tips this morning. And I'm sorry, I don't have these up on slides, so if you're taking notes, write fast. Here you go. Number one, we start by praying for God to soften our hearts and to see people as Jesus does. Because guess what? If we don't start there, anything we do is most likely going to be from the wrong motivation. And it won't last. So we need to pray that God will soften our hearts and help us see people as Jesus does. Secondly, then we can ask him for wisdom to know which of those are closest to us and in need of some help that we can give, and then the, ask him for the courage to go and do it. And third, we follow that up by praying collectively as a local church about how we can make a difference in the lives of people in these groups. Because guess what? We can definitely do more together than any one of us can do alone. I mean, which of these groups is our church uniquely equipped to help? And which one may require us to partner with some other area ministries and organizations to reach and to help? Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us enough to send your Son into this world. Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to go to the cross for our sins. God, and not just for ours, but for the sins of every person on the planet. And in doing that, you showed just how valuable, how much you treasure each person. And I pray that you would help us in the days ahead as we, as we move from place to place and we encounter people that you would Help us to see them with your eyes as treasured ones, some of them still lost and needing to come home to their father. Jesus, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand in the days ahead. God, I pray that you would also give us your spirit of wisdom and power and courage to go out and to do what you have called and equipped us to do to make a difference in the lives of those that you are still seek seeking and reaching, God. We love you so much. Just to ask for all these things in your precious holy name today. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Check out our webpage at countrysidefm.org for more opportunities to connect with us. God bless.